The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, welcome everybody. Um, I, in general, will just give a few minutes for uh, other attendees to hop on and uh, figure out the username, the login, all that kind of stuff as we're dashing about our lives trying to you know, get educated on these webinars. So um, I did throw it out there before. I don't know if Corey, uh, one of the our CTS marketing people who you may have run across, but I don't know if he's by his computer and can hear me right now. Um, so I'll ask him if he can hear my audio, but I'll also just say if anyone else out there in the internet world can hear my audio, if you want to either chime in, raise your hand, type, type something in and just let me know you can, you can hear me. That'd be great. Cool. Perfect. All right. Looks like I'm getting indicators that we are on board here. So that's good. I can still see some people uh, coming in. So let's just give maybe a minute or two more uh, to let these people just trickle on in here. And so give everybody some time to also get out their pen and paper if they want to <laughs> take some notes. Uh, I will say this too, though. Um, if you, everybody online here, if if you do hear something that your training partners or friends should hear, um, I, we're going to be recording this and uh, we'll distribute it in some form or fashion or make it available for uh, after the webinar to um, to listen to again or share with others. So. <laughs> and now, <clears throat> now that I can see a little bit more, yep. Thank you, Corey. And I just um, access my uh, questions and um, the, the texting side of things. So for all of you um, who have indicated to me that we're good to go, you can hear me. Thank you very much. I super appreciate that. Uh, and also know that if you haven't been on to one of our webinars before or go to webinar, you can type in questions along the way and I will do my best to either answer them in real time if it, if it applies to what we're talking about or uh, weave them in toward the end. So feel free to definitely, um, definitely type a few questions in there if you have them, um, if they come to mind. Uh, but I will also have a Q&A session after the webinar itself. So. Thank you, Corey, for that reminder. Super appreciated. Um, <clears throat> so, with that said, and to kind of keep on uh, keep on time here, I, I do want to get going. People will continually uh, trickle in, and, and that's fine. Um, so, that being said, uh, welcome, welcome to the uh, the uh, what I'm calling the tapering, peaking, and performance webinar, and this is geared toward the Leadville 100 mountain bike race. Now, for those of you on here doing Leadville 100, I'm just going to assume uh, that you know what you're in for in terms of that it's a huge bucket list event. It's it's up at altitude. It's um, a very gnarly, hard 100 plus mile race. Don't forget the plus. There are a couple extra miles in there now, and it's in Leadville, Colorado. Okay, so uh, the reason why I say all that kind of with with a smile is um, I, I'm I'm going to assume. Uh, you know a certain set of knowledge that you know somewhat of the course and in, in what you're in for. However, what this presentation is geared toward is helping you to optimize performance for that particular event, but also for those who aren't doing Leadville or they just have general curiosities of peaking, tapering, and race day strategies. Um, you'll also be able to take away um, something, you know, gold nugget, uh, for hopefully from this presentation as well. So it will be, um, we're, we're first going to start with the science of tapering, peaking, and then we're going to look at um, how that relates to the training side of things. Because as a coach, 
what I always like to do is I like to start with the science and I focus on the training and preparation. I want to give the athlete the tools then to whether you're coached by a, another coach out there or you're self-coached, I want to equip you with the information and tools to prepare you for your Leadville 100 or your Breck Epic or your uh, whatever, whatever you're preparing for, whatever that huge goal is that you have this year, uh, I'm going to cover many things here. So without further ado, let's get into the thick of it. So uh, throughout, throughout as well, uh, just because I've been uh, talking all day, I even got a little bike ride in. You'll hear me taking a drink of water uh, just to <laughs> help me keep talking. So my apologies. All right. So as every good uh, <laughs> scientist out there uh, likes to do, we always I, I like to start with the definition. And you've heard tapering. You've heard peaking. We're going to go through the definitions to get a basic uh, basic understanding, a basis of what we're talking about. So by definition, I'm just going to read this verbatim because it's important. Um, the, the best definition that I've found out there actually comes from Hika, who is uh, the world-renowned uh, physiologist in tapering and peaking. If you want to read more uh, about this subject, I'll steer you toward Mojica and Padilla. Uh, so this is coming from their research, his book um, entitled such. It's a so tapering is a progressive linear or nonlinear reduction in training load during a variable period of time to reduce the physiological and psychological stress of daily training and, op and to optimize sports performance. Now, there's a lot in there. We'll get into some visuals for those visual learners of what linear, nonlinear uh, means. We're going to break down the uh, reduction in training load, what that looks like. And we're going to talk about the physiological and psychological stresses as well. So bear with me, but that is our working definition. The translation of all that is in a taper or while we're tapering, the overall goal is to decrease stress that has been induced from training. So hopefully those of you doing lead bill 100 have been doing a bunch of training right now. And you're probably a little tired because it's, it's July. Okay. Your big event. It's coming up in about five or six weeks. So you should be making a big push right now to do all the training, get really tired. Because if you recall, and I tell this to my athletes all the time, and I, I saw some of my athletes' names on this list, you've heard me say it before, but stress plus rest equals adaptation. That's coming from a, a bio, uh, old school biologist, uh, Hans Selyer, uh, back at the turn of the century. And what he realized was when you stress an organism and you rest it, it forms an adaptation. He applied that to human beings and it also stuck. Now, uh, Tudor Bumpa and exercise physiologists uh, since have realized that specific stress plus rest equals specific adaptation. Uh, and what we're talking about is here in sport. And um, I'll leave it at that for now. But this is the working um, definition of a taper and what we're trying to achieve during a taper. Now, here is where the visual comes into play. This is, um, this is taken from Lemur. Uh, if you want to look up this, uh, um, this strategy here, but essentially what this is saying, and Mojica uses this in his uh, methods as well, but there's four methods of a taper. There's the linear taper that you can see here. Uh, and just to orient you a little bit on what we're looking at, this is normal training load, okay? So if, if this is the hardest training that we're doing, however we're quantifying training load, as this goes up, it gets harder. And as this goes, and this is a time scale down on the X axis, uh, and this is the number of days of the taper. And the schematic here, what this is showing is if we're up here at 90 to 100% load, if this is where we're starting our taper, uh, all of a sudden we're gonna start to reduce our taper. Uh, very linearly. Okay. So just every week we're, we're dumping 10% of our training load. However, we're measuring that for cycling power. Okay. Uh, power and time. Uh, then there is what we call an exponential taper with a slow decay, which means we're gradually, uh, bringing this down. Okay. Down to some parameters that we'll talk about here in a little bit, but it's a slower decay than this rapid decay right here. Okay. Now, this is taking away the volume and the training 
load, the training stress, this is the fast decay of the exponential taper is taken away very quickly and then finding some type of uh, normative state here a little bit. The step taper, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that's where you just drop it right away and then you keep training load uh, very low. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to summarize real quick for you <laughs> is the, the exponential fast decay taper is what you want for Leadville. And we'll talk about why, okay? And that's gonna be a two to three week time period. This shows two weeks here, 14 days. But this is what I have found to be the most successful for uh, a, a big one day event, uh, like Leadville 100, to be very, very effective, okay? And now I know that uh, many of you, you're like, oh my gosh, this is maybe getting a little too sciencey. Um, bear with me for just a minute. We're gonna get into the application of this. but I want to show you, and this is very important, where the science is coming from on how we get a peak, okay? Now, that being said, let's take a look at what, what I mean by a peak or what, what the working definition is of peaking, okay? When you taper properly, the, the whole concept of this is to, again, eliminate the training stress uh, so that we see a performance after or a peak. The definition, of a, peak of a peak is the expected mean, uh, or what we can see in a peak performance here is the expected mean improvement in an individual performance time with an effective taper should be two to 3% uh, with a range of zero to 6%, okay? And so what Mahika is saying here is that if we do a good job of taking away the training stress, we should see a bump in performance. And for a lot of us cyclists, 20-minute uh, power is a very good gold standard uh, performance, so let's just assume that. And if we take that 20-minute performance um, before our taper, and let's just call it 200 watts, okay? And if we perform our taper quite well, what we're going to see is that if we run a few of the numbers, we'll see a good 5 to maybe 10-watt improvement Okay, uh, after a proper taper, you say five to 10 watts. Well, that's not much, but you think about it. On a 20 minute effort, five to 10 watts, if you're producing 200 watts for 20 minutes, it's far better than, than not having the five to 10 watts, right? So it's a, it's a small improvement, but hey, I'll take it. Okay, small improvement, but I'll take it. The other big thing is the psychological stress that comes away from that. So a lot of you, again, doing lead build 100 right now, you're probably beat up. You're probably tired. Legs are probably heavy. That's great. That's where you should be right now. What happens when we taper is we're going to, one, get a little bump in performance, but then the psychological stress, all the, the, the kind of the, the burden of training will alleviate and mentally you're going to feel much more um, fresh full of energy, that type of thing. And that's a little bit harder to measure. Notice I'm not saying anything about the psychological right now. We know it's there, but uh, it, it's it's not as prevalent as in, um, uh, say, power data, pacing data, that kind of thing. Okay. And let me spend just a, uh, just a quick minute here on the fitness fatigue model. When we're talking about uh, what happens during that peak, okay, before we're training. And when we, in this plus and minus over here on the Y axis, these are training impulses. Though the, the X axis here is somewhat of a homostasis of wherever the athlete is starting. So we put training impulses in and we create fatigue here in the green line. Fatigue is going down as we're giving um, training impulses here and they're developing fitness as we, as we, uh, induce more fatigue. Okay. Initially that performance is going to have, it's going to be malperformance. It's going to be not good performance because you're tired. Right. And that could be a lot of us right now training for lead. But over time you get used to that training impulse and you start to get stronger and stronger. Maybe you get back to where, where you were and you're like, well, was that worth it? Well, all of a sudden you hit this time period where you take away the training impulses and I've lost my mouse here a little bit, but as the green is going up, you're taking away the fatigue. The red is 
the red is coming up and that is the change in performance that we're talking about. So in a very simplistic manner, this is a peak happening right here, okay? Just in concept. That's all I want you to realize is training impulses, you get tired, uh, super compensation happens and you have a change in performance. This is coming from Pritchard and um, he's a, another author that I would encourage you to uh, read if you're interested in more about uh, peaking as well as Mojica. So the takeaways, the summary, just to boil it all down because there, I mean, there are books written about this. Uh, there are endless research papers and it's all really good stuff. So grab a cup of coffee and have at it. But these are the, the takeaways. A good taper should last two to three weeks, 14 to 21 days for a one day event uh, such as Leadville 100, like we're talking about. You want to decrease volume by that. And that's a big number right there. See that? 41 to 60%. Uh, and you want to do it in an exponential fast decay, like we talked about, the kind of swoopy one down to the right. The intensity now, this should actually stay very, so this should stay high. Okay. So similar to the current training period that you were doing, say you were doing climbing repeats, because that's a good example of what we'll get into here in a minute. Um, you want to keep intensity high because you're dropping the volume and you want to keep training load up. We'll take a look at what that actually uh, looks like in a, in a, in a training, um, uh, in a training scenario, but you want to keep the intensity high. Just remember that frequency, uh, this will stay similar as well. So you don't want to change the frequency too much. You might have a slight decrease just to get the volume down relative to the hours and days that we have um, to work with. But overall, we want to keep the habits fairly similar. The application then is that you want your longest ride for Leadville, for training for Leadville, you want your longest ride or weekend to be uh, two to three weeks out from the race day. And you want to quickly decrease the volume after that. I'll show you how here in a minute. You want to in, uh, keep the intensity in the taper or slightly increase it. You also want to decrease the frequency slightly and then focus on good recovery habits. So that being said, th so this is a good slide to take a screenshot of or um, jot down a few notes, something like that. Now we're going to get into my favorite part, which is the training side of things. So uh, I use training peaks. All of us at CTS, uh, all of us coaches use Training Peaks to prescribe um, training. And I'm just going to check my, yeah, no one's, uh, okay. Thank you, John. Uh, I did lose audio for a second. It's back. Thank you for that. Um, okay, great. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, this is my favorite part. We use Training Peaks to prescribe training to our athletes, the athlete then uploads, and I assume a lot of you are familiar with Training Peaks. But um, what you're looking at, just to orient you, is an interactive online calendar that I took a screenshot of of said athlete and uh, who is training for Leadville this year. And each week, uh, this is actually uh, July 15th, so this is I guess next week, right? Yeah. Um, so next week we're kind of coming in. So this is about five weeks out, six weeks out of the. Um, of the Leadville race. And each week is represented here with a summary of the training uh, modeled over here. Uh, the, the model scores are up here in terms of the fitness and fatigue, what we're looking at um, and the total hours. Okay. So what I'm showing you here is uh, essentially the start of the taper, which is going to be right here because this is going to be the longest ride weekend. Now, let me walk you through this just a little bit and tell you why I'm doing what I'm doing with this athlete. Um, I'm going to skip ahead just one second, though, because as you can see in this week, this is the biggest week. Then we start to taper it down. Then we taper it down. And then I'm just going to show you real quick. There. And here is the Leadville race. Okay. So we're going to go back. Now... <clears throat> I might have missed a week in there, did I? Let's see the fourth? No, I got it. Okay, perfect. All right. So now this is also assuming all the training was done very well leading up into this uh, kind of pivotal weekend. 
a big ride weekend, okay? Assuming everything has gone well up there uh, or throughout the training, I'm gonna bring this athlete in with the week prior being a fairly easy week or recovery block or something like that. So they're gonna come into this week fresh, just assume that. And when they do, I'm gonna hit them with some intensity, okay? So what we call climbing repeats or uh, the, each of these efforts should feel like a nine out of 10 or like a 95 to 100%, uh, 105% of FTP, okay? Uh, next, uh, a road group ride there on Wednesday with some leg speed, race pace intensity, and then uh, just an endurance miles uh, ride on Thursday, Friday is going easy. And then all of a sudden we have this weekend, six and four. You say, well, why? Okay, why six and four? Okay, how come in that combination? Here again, this is coaching experiential knowledge. This is for an athlete who, uh, this is for an athlete who is, their goal is nine hours or just under, okay? So they, they're not going to be out there for, uh, hopefully, hopefully they're not going to be out there for much longer, you know, than 10 or 12 hours. And we've practiced this over and over. So the longest ride I'm actually going to have them do is only six hours. Okay. The reason for that is I have found the training response or the fatigue that happens after six hours is not as beneficial, uh, based on the time constraints of this athlete. Uh, to have them out there for that long on a given day. I've found it to be far more effective for them to do six hours on a Saturday morning, come back, rest, do family stuff, all that kind of stuff, <clears throat> and then head out there again on Sunday for another four hours, uh, essentially you know, 18 hours or so, 12 hours or so, um, not a full 24-hour recovery before this next long ride. And you can see that I'm saying, okay, take this out hard, race pace for the first hour, third hour, final hour. So there's going to be some general intensity guidelines, no intervals per se. Uh, but this is going to start hard, finish hard, and have some hard in between, but not always. And then on Sunday, this is going to start a little easier and progress up for the last hour being a little harder. Okay. Meanwhile, we're going to practice our nutrition hydration strategies. Um, but overall, the concept that I want you to take away from this slide, if anything else, is look at this combo. This is 10 hours of riding chopped up into two days with not 24 hours recovery in between. And that's a big TSS kind of combined to get an optimal blend of fatigue without inducing too much fatigue in order to get a good return on the time for an adaptation. Okay. Uh, so again, this is six and four, that's 10 hours uh, total time, a little bit more than what they'll do out at Leadville, ideally. Um, but I'm not going to ride them nine hours for this event. It's just not worth it. Okay. Now going back to that fast decay, what I'm doing here is you can see total duration over here, 16 hours for this week, going to the next week without even looking at the training. We're just under 11 hours. So I've dropped the volume. Now this isn't, this is real world stuff. It's not science. So the concept that I want you to see what I'm doing here is I've dropped the volume pretty significantly right away. And again, that goes, if I can just scan back and remind you of what we're focused on, on the exponential fast decay taper, we want to take that training load, especially volume, and we want to drop it really quickly right away 41 to 60 percent we want to get it down right away and then start to normalize a little bit okay and if you recall here you drop the volume by 41 to 60 percent and you can keep the intensity fairly high let's look at that so now i've had last week i had two days of intensity with lots of volume this this week i have a couple days easy and normally that we should come out of that, but not be a hundred percent for this, but I'm going to hit them with intensity. Then I'm going to give them a rest day. These are two hard and tense days. Then I'm going to bring them to some moderate volume over the weekend. Again, we drop the volume, but we kept intensity in there. We come into the following weekend because I want to make sure that I don't have a ton of fatigue coming into this weekend in particular. We've got one day of intensity and I probably could give 
maybe a little bit more intensity in here if we need to. But that's where, as I'm talking with the athlete, I'll just make sure that they are uh, good to go, or maybe we keep that easy, whatever the case is, but at least one hard day midweek. And then we go into the weekend with some pacing strategy and fueling strategy, race pace, that kind of stuff here. Okay. And as we go into, let me just check my questions real quick. Um, no, we're good. Okay. Uh, and as we go into race weekend now, you can see similar patterns where I've dropped the volume. This, this weekly volume doesn't accurately represent because they will be doing Leadville, which has not a prescribed uh, duration right there, but you can see the drastic volume decrease. Uh, you know, we're not doing much over 75 minutes. We've got some intensity here. They're traveling to Colorado and then just regulating their legs before they get into uh, the race day. So that is a fairly ideal real world situation where we're taking a person that has some time constraints, um, nothing crazy, but they're preparing for Leadville. Um, I'm going to keep on charging along if, uh, if anybody has questions on because I would imagine they do on, on some of that training, just, just hold tight. We'll get into the, the Q and A's here in just a minute uh, or just a few minutes actually, but I actually want to get into um, another way to structure training. And this is coming from an athlete last year of uh, how we incorporate altitude in as well, because we'll talk about altitude considerations <clears throat> because most of us don't live in Leadville. Most of us don't live in Colorado. So what do we do to prepare for, for altitude? And we'll get into the implications of what that looks like, but you should know that your performance will go down at altitude. You will not be able to, if your functional threshold power is 300 Watts, you will not be able to sustain that at altitude. How much? We'll get into that here in a minute, but you have to develop your pacing strategies and your, your power output and your perceived effort uh, accordingly. The best way to do that, do that is to go up to altitude and train. Pre-ride Leadville, do the, the Silver Rush 50, uh, do the Firecracker 50. We'll look at some of that kind of stuff because this athlete needed to learn pacing and also ha had the time and ability to have exposures to altitude. So this is last year and this is a uh, um, uh, female athlete. And this is the 4th of July. Uh, she raised the firecracker. And so this is the first week of, of July. So this is kind of starting out a couple, you know, a couple months, uh, sorry, six to seven weeks. And it's not as perfect as the example that you just saw now, but that's fine because a lot of us don't live in a perfect world. At least I don't. Some of you may. Um, but what we did was we brought her into this week fairly fresh. We raced. Then we stayed up high. It was, it was fairly easy ride there. Uh, but you can notice about two hours. That was just to flush out the legs and ride and get exposure, uh, a continual exposure to altitude. She's staying in Breckenridge at this point. Um, Similar thing here, added on just a little bit more. She's in single track here, and you can tell by the – and she just has a heart rate uh, on here, no power meter. And you can tell that this was a harder day. Then we went in and we raced Silver Rush as well. Then she flew back home to sea level, but that's a big block right there. Raced high, stayed high, raced high again, then got home. Um, all of that we used for not only training and overload, but pacing strategy for Lead Bill 100 came down and I do recall, I'm pretty sure she wasn't completely ready for that hard workout right there. Uh, just, you know, <laughs> just to let you know. Uh, so then we came in and we had a big weekend. So this was a, a near seven and three. She was going for a sub nine as well. I prescribed six on this day. They were out for a little bit longer, um, but it wasn't overly intense. Okay. But the whole goal was to get around um, around 10 hours on the weekend, plus or minus a few hours, uh, an hour each day. And so you can see that she achieved that. So that's good. We're into that long ride progression. Then another unique thing that we did was, let's see. So this week we came, freshened her up. We did some intensity in there and there was medium hard weekend, medium hard, uh, uh, volume 
and intensity here. I think that this was some racing. Um, and then we came into this weekend here or this week, sorry. And we did the Leadville stage race, which if many of you haven't heard about the Leadville stage race or haven't been, um, or want to know the course, that's actually a really good way to, uh, to prepare for the Leadville 100. What they do is they take the Leadville 100 and they chop it up into three days. You race essentially the first, uh, no, you know, and quote me on this. Um, I just did it last year, so I should know, uh, but basically out to twin lakes. So the first 20 miles or so, um, on day one, then you race up Columbine on day two, and then you race back from twin lakes on day three. So it chops it up for most people. It's going to be between two and a half to four hours on day one. It's going to be two to three hours on day two and another two and a half to four hours on, on day four. But to recon the course, get some racing in, that's not going to be overly fatiguing. I'm actually a big fan of that. Um, it's not the most exciting race in the world, but it's actually a pretty cool race. They, and they do a fantastic job. Um, so did the Leadville stage race, and then we came in um, to this recovery week, essentially, and she couldn't go hard or long on the weekend, so we did a long ride on the Friday to keep the long ride progression going. She was up at altitude. We stayed at altitude uh, for over a full week leading in, and uh, we got the big buckle there at nine hours. Okay, so not perfect using different training modalities with strength training, some easy swims for recovery, uh, mountain bike focus, and uh, we got the buckle, okay? And so I'm giving you examples and rationales of how to train and use a taper for a one-day altitude event. That's my main premise in telling you that. And you can go back as well, um, and you can look at if you want to nerd out on some of these particulars, because I know she doesn't follow precisely some of these, you know, volume drops, uh, like the first example did. Okay. But for her and the preparation that we had leading up to it, it, it worked. I did drop volume. I did keep intensity. I didn't do it perfectly, but for her, it was what she needed. So again, there's an individual component to it. And this is why I'm a big proponent of whether you're coached or self-coached, you have to practice your, your, your tapering. You have to practice your peaking to see what the trends are and how you respond to training. Okay, so that kind of is, uh, we're gonna get into a couple different things, hydration, nutrition, as you just saw, but I just covered a lot on tapering, peaking and training. I want to take just a quick break and see if anyone had questions on some of the ta tapering, peaking and training that I just went over. And feel free to unmute yourself, ask away. You can also type in the comment if you, if you don't want to um, get into the banter. I'll pull one from um, from the question section here. Uh, and this is the Tahoe Trail 100K. <clears throat> yeah, it's a good event, July 13th. Um, can you make a recommend, can you make a recommendation, sorry, can you recommend an adjustment that allows me to do this event? Um, yeah, Tom, I, I think I understand your question. So if you wanna do that event, the July 13th, um, I would use that as a long, hard training ride. I, I mean, it's a race. Yeah, there's a start line, finish line. And what I've done with athletes in the past on that one as well, uh, that's, you know, you're still, what is it, three weeks out? That'd be, it's a perfect timing period. So what I would do is I just freshen up with a kind of an easy week leading into that. I would do the race. Uh, I think it's on, someone can check, but I, if it's on a Saturday, Definitely do it. And then what you could do is you stay an extra day in Tahoe and get in, you know, another three hour ride before you have to uh, travel home. And that's how I love using, uh, and that's a moderate altitude, but that's how I love using races as training days, um, especially in conjunction with where we're going for the ultimate goal, you know, whether it's Leadville or whatever. Um, because the more training, the more 
practice that you can get specific to your event. It's so perfect. It's so perfect. And the, um, the Tahoe trail hundred K is, is great for that. Cause it's mountain bike, moderate altitude, uh, there's aid stations it's run by the same company. So, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff going there. So I would definitely use that event as training and that's how I would do it. I just make sure that you're fairly fresh and have it be like a practice run for race day. <clears throat> practice run, not only for pacing, uh, but for equipment and also hydration and nutrition. So if, if, uh, if anybody has any more questions, feel free to fire away. Uh, and, the, and I'm looking at this one here, Camelback versus Bottles, uh, expectations for drops at eight stations. So we'll get into that here in just a minute. That's a perfect, that's a great question. And it's a perfect segue into where we're headed next. So uh, if anyone else has, oh, Tahoe's this weekend. <laughs> Freshen up. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if it is, uh, and I don't, I just kind of mean that uh, funnily. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that it's a it's an excellent uh, training weekend uh, for Leadville. Uh, no, she was not. She was not an elite. Uh, so someone just said this is clearly an elite female athlete. How would the training differ for someone who's just looking to meet the twelve hour cutoff? Yeah, that, so that's a good question. She's not elite. She's middle aged. She's forty uh, three. Um, she's fast. She's, uh, but it's taken a while for her to get to where she is. So don't, don't get me wrong. Um, and how would this differ? Uh, so this would, I mean, go back to the first example I gave you, he was still do, aiming for about nine hours. If we're doing 12 hour though, I would extend, um, sorry, there's some noise in the background. Uh, but I would extend that long ride out to maybe seven hours on the longest ride seven ish. Um, I wouldn't go much over seven or eight. Uh, and that is taking into account if the athlete doesn't have a ton of endurance experience. Cause the other thing that you have to keep in mind as a coach, what I keep in mind is how long have they been doing this? Okay. If they only came to the mountain bike, say the athletes, you know, 45 years old and, and they've been riding for three years. Well, that athlete is going to respond much differently to uh, aerobic rides, endurance rides, long rides, much differently than the athlete that I gave um, as an example, uh, the, the female athlete, because she's been doing this a while. It's taken a long time. And so how I would adjust is I would, to answer your question directly, I'd probably extend that long ride out, assuming training has gone well. I would then add in more recovery before I would come back to some intensity. I might not even prescribe much in the way of intervals the week after that long weekend, if that makes sense. So I, I would probably do like a seven and a three on Saturday and Sunday, and then Monday, rest day, Tuesday, maybe even rest day, Wednesday, easy day, and then kind of crescendo back into the weekend. But I would definitely give a 21 day uh, taper if I'm, if I'm um, going for, uh, and, I've, and I've coached many people just hopefully getting under 12 hours. So don't, don't hear me wrong. I don't coach just nine hour people. Um, but that is my approach. I would go slightly longer just to have them get their sit bones, nutrition, hydration, and mental state under control of what a 12 hour day looks like. Um, but I would also uh, plan more rest and recovery in there. So Victoria, I hope that answers your question. Um, what should, what should the race pace, race pace? Yeah, we'll, uh, so this is coming from, from Francisco race pace for Leadville. We'll talk about that here in a minute. If you can just hold off or remind me if I don't get to it. Um, and then I'm just scanning to see, yeah, uh, scanning to see if we have any more questions on training in particular stage race change your approach. Yeah. Okay. So let's leave Victoria, your other question, stage race and how that'll change. Let's wait until uh, a little bit after the other question I wanted to answer right now though, is uh, when would you choose a three week versus a two week taper? Great question. I would, I would always have a three week if I had the time. I would do a two week if the training didn't go well and that long ride didn't happen three weeks out. And that's the short of it. 
And I would say oftentimes when I'm training people for Leadville in particular, uh, all life happens and we normally go with a 14 day taper. So when I, when everything's flowing on our side, um, I go three weeks. When it's not, I go two. So Adrian, thank you for that question. Okay, uh, last on last one here on training, then we'll move to uh, hydration and nutrition. Guideline on how, how much to work the road versus the mountain bike. So in general, <clears throat> you want specificity of training. So if you're going to do Leadville on a mountain bike, which we all are, you should be doing more training on a mountain bike. 60-40, uh, 60% 60 of your training, in my opinion, should uh, minimally be on a mountain bike at this point. Um, uh, when we're talking like three weeks out, because you want you want your body to be in that position, you want to be adapted to that position, and you want to make sure that your equipment is is running well. So a sixty forty split is definitely what I would suggest. Um, doing more is great. An eighty twenty split might be is again it's specificity. I still think that there's very good value in riding and training on the road bike. Um, dependent again, not even dependent on where you live, but for everybody, uh, because but there's tons of road sections in Leadville, but that's not, uh, the only reason. The other reason is, uh, the training, it's faster, you're drafting, you're working on some of these other aspects that you'll need to use for Leadville, um, in conjunction with, uh, access to good roads for intervals and things like that. So, um, Victoria, you're welcome. Uh. Yeah, we'll get into some corral placement as well here in just a minute. So uh, with the time that we have, <clears throat> I want to jump into hydration, and then I'm going to uh, get back into some of these questions. So for now, if something comes to mind, feel free to throw it in there, but I'm going to um, do away with the questions for just a minute, and we're going to segue into hydration and nutrition. So... If there's anything that you take away from this segment of the presentation, it is over here. No matter how good your training was or how proper your taper was, your number one success on race day is going to be all about your hydration and your nutrition and the execution of it. The reason why I put hydration first is all, the best nutrition doesn't work on a dehydrated gut. So we first start with uh, keeping the athlete hydrated and then fueled. And again, no matter, <laughs> no matter what your CTL is coming on Leadville and there's a lot of people, especially, I mean, I lived in Colorado for 10 years and Summit County people in particular, they're just tough. Okay. They're tough as nails and they'll come in and, you know, maybe they'll do half of what I'm just talking about now and they'll come in and just smash the crap out of people. Because they're tough and they eat and drink and keep moving forward. And that, if you take away anything, eat, drink, move forward, that is how you get through Leadville. Okay? We're going to get more detailed, so uh, bear with me here. Uh, your plan on race day. So the, the plan, we'll, we'll get into the, the particulars of your plan. But your plan should be a culmination of what's been working in training on these long rides. So uh, on the long rides, I will get nitty gritty about the fueling and hydration for the athlete. Not so much. We don't do intervals. We'll maybe pick out hill climbs and all this kind of stuff, but it's, it's more about what are, what's the athlete eating and drinking per hour in the first 90 minutes and then every hour thereafter, because I'm assuming that the athlete starts with a good breakfast uh, and then they're topped off. And the first 90 minutes does look a little different uh, than every hour thereafter. Uh, basically, uh, eating, eating less, probably drinking about the same in that first 90 minutes. And then every hour on the hour, it's clockwork. Okay. So you want to, again, same thing with tapering and peaking. You want to start with the science and then dial it in for the individual athlete. And I've made it very, as simple as I can think of it as many times as I've given a talk like this is I've summarized the science for you right here. And as I take a sip here. Speaking of hydrating, uh, you want to start with 30 to 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour. CHO is a shorthand for carbohydrate. 350 to 700 milligrams of sodium. 
electrolytes. But the primary um, electrolyte in uh, sports drinks and other nutrition products out there is a sodium citrate or sodium chloride, sometimes sodium bicarbonate. You just focus on sodium and we're good. So that's the milligram per hour. This is all per hour, what I'm talking about. 20 to 40 fluid ounces per hour. So this is one to two bottles per hour. Or if you're using hydration packs, which I'm a big fan of, uh, sometimes you can you can have little flow meters on your on your um, Camelbacks hydration packs, but you want to break it down so that per hour your bladders are covering uh, that amount for whatever goal time you have. And then finally, the calories that we're aiming for is 120 to 360 calories <clears throat> per hour. Now, to bring some of this together, you, I want you to know, to, to work with these numbers and understand what they mean, because it gets to be a numbers game. I'm going to give you some examples of how to put this all together, but real quick, if we just assume carbohydrate intake, one gram of carbohydrate is four calories. So when we take four times 30, that's 120. We take four times 90, that's 360. You say, well, what about my protein? Well, uh, straight up from the horse's mouth, you don't need a ton of protein. Not for this, it's tasty. Uh, certain things like jerky and all, I, I still eat it. Um, you don't need a ton of protein. And I wouldn't encourage you to take a ton of protein on race day. Now, some other coaches and some other athletes may have different views on that, totally fine. Uh, when it comes to performance, you want hydration, you want sodium, you want carbohydrate. We won't talk too much about caffeine. I'm a big fan of caffeine, uh, but we're not going to include it too much on this unless I get into question. Okay. Now, I'm not saying only eat carbohydrate throughout the day. Don't get me wrong on that either because I want you to eat fat, carbohydrate, and maybe some protein if it's coming in the source of whole food peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, bars, uh, slices of pizza. Uh, Coop has his famous Coop burritos that he uses for ultra endurance running. So I, I am whole food all the way. Uh, sport drink, water, whole food is great choice for Leadville because of the, um, the intensity is fairly low, but because of the access to the food, I'm a, a huge proponent of sport nutrition like gels, uh, like bars, this kind of thing. So uh, the fueling strategy that I encourage my athletes to, to use has components of uh, whole food and sport nutrition products. Okay, But where these numbers are coming from is from uh, actually Asker's Yuka Group is a uh, read anything from him on, on sport nutrition and absorption in the gut for uh, athlete performance. Okay because the current recommendations coming out of his lab uh, is up to 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour. And this is going at a fairly steady state pace, call it uh, 85, 80, uh, 85, 90% of max. Um, and we're, they're absorbing 360 calories per hour. You think about that too. I mean, that's, that's a little bit more than what I do per hour, just FYI, FYI and at the upper end. But what I'm giving you is a range so that in the weeks coming up, you can try this in your training. You can, you can first understand what it looks like. You can see how close or not close you've been per hour and then tweak things, try things and see if, if, if it improves. In general, if I can get the athlete taking in and absorbing more carbohydrate and more calories without GI distress, they perform better. So what does this look like? Well, I don't have any fancy visuals just yet. Um, but if you can picture a uh, bottle of sport drink, half a bottle of water, one gel, what that looks like is that's about a per on per hour recommendation of what I was just talking about, about 200 calories. Now, I'm assuming a, like a sport drink that has 70 to 100 calories, osmolarity of 6 to 8% solution, 350 to 500 milligrams per serving. Okay, so 20, 18 to 20 grams in the sport drink. The gel, 20 to 25 grams of carbohydrate, about 100 calories. That's, that's what I'm assuming. That equals 200 calories, 30 ounces of fluid, 600 milligrams of sodium, and 50 grams of carbohydrate. 
or you can do a bottle of sport drink, half a bottle of water, one bar. And all, all of a sudden you just start looking at the food that you're consuming and you start to understand, you start to interact with it a little bit more because you start to break it down into numbers and those numbers need to fit in to your hour, your hourly goal. I put in some pickle juice in here. I, I, I like using pickle juice myself and with my athletes because if you haven't, we won't get into it right now, but there are some very good things that happen. By the way, we've been using pickle juice in bike racing since as long as I've been alive. Uh, <laughs> 80s, I don't know. Um, and uh, so I'm a big fan of pickle juice. You can buy shots of it or what I do is I get like little gel flasks in a jar of pickles, far less expensive. Um, and I'll put pickle juice or I'll have pickles at the aid stops and I'll eat pickles, uh, uh, pretzels, um, it's absolutely delicious, but there are, uh, there is uh, the acidity as well as the sodium in pickle juice, uh, helps to alleviate cramps and prevent cramps and, uh, improves the mood in your, in your brain as well. So if you, if you do that, that looks, it's on the lighter side of the scale. Um, and these are choose call them goo, choose cliff blocks, uh, little buttons, whatever the, the chewy things out there. That's what I'm talking about. And again, you just want combination of things to uh, get to where I'm talking about in terms of that prescribed goal per hour over here. Okay. Now stay with me. We're bringing it all together with the um, pickle juice that up the sodium game quite a bit. If you get into cramping trouble out there, have pickle juice somewhere out on the course, get to know your food and fluid, what's in it and when you need. It, okay. Now, <clears throat> here is where we're getting into the applicability of Leadville and what this looks like. This is a schematic that I've used for my athletes in years past, um, as well as this year. This one, so I think this is Tracy. Yeah, so this is the 2018, so the second training example that I gave to you guys just a few minutes ago. This was her plan um, for Leadville last year. And what you're looking at here is you're looking at the topography or the, you're, you're looking at the Leadville race from start to the top of Columbine to the finish. And what I do for my athletes is I tell them where the aid stations are, or the checkpoints, pipeline one, twin lakes, one Columbine, twin lakes, two pipeline, two Carter Lake, which is uh, Carter summit, the last aid station, uh, official aid station, of course, and then the finish line. Note, there is an aid station here at Carter Summit outbound. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're going, if you're well trained and going 10 hours or faster, I generally tell my athletes don't stop. If you're going 10 to 12 hours and everything's going smoothly and you're wearing a hydration pack, I say don't stop. Just keep chugging along because pipeline will come with you know less than three hours for the majority of people and we should be able to make it to pipeline without stopping. Now, if you drop a bottle, if you get stuck, if there's bad things happening, stop. Just stop at the aid station at Carter. Otherwise, keep chugging along. Then our plan is to generally stop at each aid station. Just real quick, <clears throat> have athletes, um, excuse me, Either stop, fill up your bottle from the general aid station, or you, you have a support crew out there that brings you your stuff. Stop, chuck away what you don't need, take what you need, and then on you go. You don't want to spend more than two minutes in these aid stations, okay? If you're spending more than two minutes, with the exception of maybe going to the bathroom, like you're just wasting time. No matter if you have a support crew, general crew, whatever, um, you're wasting time. Now, if you just need to stop, hang out, and smell the roses for a little bit, cool. But just know that you are spending more time than needed. So carry on. Just move through quickly. Uh, so what I do with my athletes, again, is we get a lay of the land. We develop a pacing scheme for what we want the total finish time to be. For her, 8 hours, 45 minutes. And then I work backwards from there. And I look at historical data of finishing times for all people who finished 8.40 to 9. And I look at when they came through Carter Lake. I look at when they came through Pipeline 2, Twin Lakes 2, and onward. And then what I do is I devise a pacing model that checks us in to these um, checkpoints and aid stations. And 
tell the athlete. And, and sometimes we do, we write them on the top tube so that they're familiar or we memorize them, what, whatever, whatever's good for you, um, do it. But this way it breaks it down into smaller manageable pieces from a pacing standpoint. Meanwhile, we then devise a plan of what she needs at each aid station. And I hope that you guys can see it on there. If not, just really get close to your computer. Um, you can see this after the fact too, but uh, for example, uh, Twin Lakes 2, there's one miniature Coke, that's what that is, um, a bottle of carbohydrate for, for her, it's, she has her own thing, bottle of water, and then a handful of trail mix or pretzels because she's already got some stuff in her pockets and, and away we go. And then a pipeline too, we pick up another bottle of sport drink, another bottle of water. Uh, she uses this particular brand here um, and this particular brand of gels. And so you customize it, you dial it in for yourself and when we start to add all of this up, we then have a global plan or a kind of a high level plan of what we need to do to get through Leadville 100 at our goal time uh, based on training data, how much calories she's going to be expending. And I did it at altitude. We make a goal intake based on what she's doing in training. She, she's generally taking in 35 to 40% of this burn rate right here. And then we, um, we have the calories. We try to take in that 35% of 48 burn. And we have a, uh, a goal intake, uh, a goal per hour intake for total calories as well as ounces uh, total and ounces per. And then we make sure that we've got everything in the aid station that she needs that she starts with probably a little extra just in case she misses something in the aid stations. And then finally, what you're seeing down here is, um, again, this is just to go through and make sure that everybody's on the same page with what to consume between each aid station. So how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. A lot of people hate that analogy, but you get what I'm saying. It's a big, big day. How do you do 103 miles at altitude? Well, you just break it down. And so it, use this schematic. There's a lot of schematics out there uh, of, of how to break something down. There's another one that I use for uh, Ironman athletes in particular, but also for uh, stage racing and stuff like this. And this is go back to Asher Zugendruck. He's a, uh, he's a great physiologist. He started his own company. It's called Core Nutrition. And what this does is this is a customizable nutrition uh, tool that you can you, you put in stuff about yourself, your event, uh, your fuel preference that you'd like to use, and then you start to devise a plan. And it gives you little um, visuals of what this looks like. Go ahead, I mean, check it out. I think it's cool. Oscar does phenomenal stuff in the industry. Um, I, I like his nutrition, I like his research. I'm big, uh, I'm a fanboy. <laughs> and uh, I've been using his stuff for a while, so. Definitely check it out. It could help you for Leadville for sure. If there's some uh, multi-sport athletes on this talk, uh, I'd really encourage it for that as well. Um, and it's a pretty, pretty good tool. But again, whatever it takes to help you break down uh, the overarching goal plan uh, for pacing, nutrition, and hydration, do it. Because it'll help wrap your brain around and give you confidence on race day. That's like, this is what I'm doing between each aid station. This is when I'm rolling up. This is what I should have in my pocket. This is what I should be throwing out of my pocket and onward. You have a plan. Okay. Now, um, before we get into, I'm just going to go back to this and we're coming up on an hour. I'm probably going to go a little bit over an hour. Just that's how I roll. Um, there's always a ton of questions on nutrition, hydration, and I'm, I'm going to open up a can of worms and just say, you know, maybe let's, let's do five minutes before I uh, summarize uh, what, all the talking points as well as give you some like pure race day uh, information. And so we'll kick it off with this first one that I got from Eric. And he said, what are your thoughts on electrolyte capsules? Um, yeah, uh, my, my thoughts are they're good because it gets salt in. Uh, one drink, one more. But my, my problem with them is the way a, 
the way absorption of salt and carbohydrate work is everything starts to be absorbed in your mouth, on your tongue and inside your mouth. Okay. A lot of people don't realize that or understand that. And so if it starts absorbing on your tongue and in your mouth and downward into the stomach, uh, you're missing out. Okay. You're missing out on some absorption, but you're also missing out. Like I talked about on pickle juice, the acidic juice, as well as the, uh, the electrolytes, the sodium sends signals to your brain. Let's the brain know that you're taking in sodium. It can sense it. And there's pleasure centers of your brain fire when you put sugar in sport drink sodium. It lets the body know that you're taking it on board. So it says, okay, I'm cool. Blood sugar normalize hormones do this, all that kind of stuff. And so with anything capsule related, it's okay because it's getting in. It's not ideal because it's not going over the palate. So I would always encourage you for your sodium intake to make sure you can taste the salt. I hope that answers your question, uh, Eric. Um, let's see. I think there was, there was one question on hydration pack versus uh, bottles. And in short, I, I would say if you're going – Nine, again, probably 10 hours in faster, you can do bottles, but that means you have to do this plan really well. And you have to also make sure that you can carry three bottles at any given time. If you're doing 10 to 12 hours, I would go Camelback. And there's some coaches that will uh, argue with me on that. And I, and I have under nine people use hydration packs and it's preference. Okay. But, um, and also, if it's your first time doing lead build, I'd probably encourage you to take camelbacks. And also, uh, think about think about utilizing your aid stations accordingly. So I have a lot of athletes that may start with bottles and then pick up hydration pack at pipeline. And they'll maybe even drag it up to Columbine and back down and then pick up another one and go here. Or they'll do bottles all the way up and down Columbine and then pick up a hydration pack at Twin Lakes too, and then carry that, use that for a fueling strategy all the way home. So just because this is a unique event in that it has all of these aid stations and it has uh, the capability, they have drop bags for you um, and they'll be labeled uh, the, the, the night before where you can get your stuff, uh, not to call them by but pipeline one, Twin Lakes one, Twin Lakes two, pipeline two. They'll tell you that. Go to the pre-race meeting, FYI, because you'll learn a lot. Okay, don't be a lazy athlete that doesn't go. Um, you can have drop bags there. You can put your uh, hydration packs in there, um, and you can pick them up then. Now you're also, if you do that with the race, you are then they do a pretty good job of calling up numbers and bringing stuff out to you. But there may be. Uh, some time period where you're sitting, hanging out, waiting for your stuff to come uh, to you. Just, just so you know, <clears throat> if you have um, support people that will bring all that out there for you, you can devise your game plan accordingly. So just because you start with it doesn't mean you necessarily have to finish it with the exception of your, your bicycle. Uh, so the, the, finally, what I'll say as well is if you're planning on using a hydration pack during the race, Use it, use it in training. So many times I see athletes all of a sudden change their game plan on racing or never train with a hydration pack. Then they try to ride it 100 miles with it, and then all of a sudden their back hurts. They don't know where to put their stuff. They can't access their – I mean, whatever you're going to do on race day, do it in training first. Now is the perfect time to start trying a bunch of that stuff. Uh, let's see. John, is there any difference between – uh, any difference in hydrating consistently via Camelback or in chunks with a water bottle since it's sometimes difficult to get your hands off the bars? Yeah, great question. Uh, so basically, do I take little sips or do I just chug? Um, it's a titration issue. Uh, it, it relates to titration. So anytime you put in big amounts of stuff, your body will sense that there, ooh, there's a lot on board. I'll just, um, what am I going to do with all this? Oh man, he is, he's going really hard. I got to get rid of this. And then you might have to go to the bathroom more. 
okay? As opposed to if you take a little bit in and then your stomach processes it and says, okay, there's stuff coming, there's trickling in, I can use it, I don't have to dump it, um, I can absorb it, okay, this is good. So my, my communication point to you there is smaller, more frequent is better, both with food and drink. And so when it's hard to drink because you can't take the hands off the bars, uh, yeah, that's a tricky part. So the first hour getting through Carter uh, Summit, it's tricky, uh, but it's also the first hour. So assuming you know you've you started hydrated and topped off on fuel, um, you definitely want to start drinking. You know, once you hit the road section, okay. But you also it comes back to the point of training. Everything we do in the race, we need to do in training. So start to get used to accessing your bottles and drink in not super, da not dangerous terrain, but even in some technical terrain. There's a lot of hill climbing on Leadville and there's a lot of opportunities to drink. You have to remember to drink. And I don't think that you'll have too much trouble finding places to drink. You just have to remind yourself to drink. So, um, for John, for you, I would say practice and training, even on like hill climbs or like some choppy bits. Uh, if you're using the, the hydration pack, um, make sure you have one with a magnetic attachment that goes to your uh, chest. And what I do is as I'm riding, not really on descents as much unless it's like super buffed out stuff, but uh, even in technical stuff, I'll just take my left hand off the bar, grab the magnetic drink thing, throw it in my mouth quick, and then put my hand back on the bar I'll take a couple drinks with the uh, the bit still in my mouth and then in a smooth section. And I might even keep it in there if I get into some gnarly stuff that I'm like, ooh, I didn't see this coming. Um, then once I hit a smooth section, I'll just take it out, magnetic strip back on my chest. So just make sure that you have the magnetic attachment and that'll help. Uh, sorry, so this question is coming from Tenny. Uh, she, let's see. Sorry, can you repeat the sodium intake Will we have access to the recording? Yes, you'll have access to the to the recording. Um, yep, all good. So sodium intake per hour, uh, 350 milligrams to 700 milligrams per hour. Now, up to 1,000, this is really variable. This, th this is getting into some variabilities. Like there's some people that can need a lot more sodium. You can test this as well. Uh, you look up uh, sport test, uh, electrolyte testing. Um, and electrolyte loss, you can you can measure this now. But <clears throat> some people can take up to even 1,200 milligrams per hour, uh, and they need that. Uh, however, I in whatever you don't use, you you will just excrete. So you don't have to worry so much about overdoing it on sodium. I mean, if you're going 1,500 migs per hour, 1,500 milligrams per hour, that's probably too much because you have to think about the balance in your stomach. Too much salt is going to cause uh, a very uh, uh, hyper uh, electrolyte, hyper electrolytic environment. So you're going to be really thirsty and your body's going to slow you down until you get some water on board. So uh, I've found great success in 350 to 700 milligrams of intake. You can look up some stuff on Oscar's You Can Group. Um, he re he's recommending that as well. But I find that to be very applicable for athletes. Uh, yeah, so if I'm doing, so this question is coming from Victoria. If I do hydration pack, should I put the sport drink in my bladder? Um, yes, for sure, you can. Um, I have athletes that do that. So you pre-mix your sport drink the, the night before, make sure that you have enough kind of laid out, and you put them in your, your hydration pack in bladders. What you can also do is have a couple different bladders and keep the hydration pack on you and then just swap the bladders, uh, assuming that you got the bladder to the aid station and you can just swap them out, have somebody put it in your back or whatever the case is. You can also just have separate hydration packs. Uh, personally, I hate cleaning my hydration bladder. So if I'm racing, uh, bladder, sorry, uh, I hate cleaning that thing. So I'll generally do water in my, in my hydration pack and then sport drink in my bottle. That's how I keep it separate for myself. Uh, but if you're relying on hydration pack for the primary, um, source of your sport nutrition drink, yes, put it in your, in your pack. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. 
Uh, let's do, yeah, this is a good question. Um, I'll take just a couple more questions here and then I'll go to a summary and then I'll, I'll open it back up for questions. So Catherine is asking about the uh, thoughts on the Martin product. Worth the extra money. Also, I hate the taste of sports drink after a certain amount of time period and just water. Is my body telling me something? Uh, so a couple questions there. The Martin product, uh, I wanted to keep this, by the way, I didn't, I didn't say this at the very start. Uh, we have sponsors, nutrition sponsors, hydration sponsors, bike sponsors, all this kind of stuff with CTS. But when I'm doing a talk like this, I like to keep the brands more neutral because you athletes, everybody on this, on this call, you're, you're using so many different products. You got to find out what works for you. And I'm, we're, we're keeping it brand neutral for the moment. Okay. So just, just talking about stuff that's out there. The, the Martin product, I, I do think, is, is very good. I have athletes using it. Um, for those of you who don't ha haven't heard of it, check it out. It's, it's cool. Um, their gels in particular are called hydrogels, and they, um, they tend to sit better in the stomachs of athletes. They have uh, it's almost, uh, what they uh, describe it as is like prehydrated or ultra-hydrated gel. Um, it's, it's sweeter, but not overly sweet for the gels and the, um, sport drink mix is very similar. So it's going to be generally a higher calorie. Um, and it kind of tastes like sweet water and there's no, there's no like prescribed or, uh, described flavor to it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you can have, you have the ability to, uh, put in the amount of calories, uh, or have the density, I guess, of the solution, the osmolarity be what you want it to be. So, Again, I, I'm a big fan because it, it gives the athlete um, the uh, manual adjustment for what they need. And I've, I've, I've had my athletes tell me nothing but really good stuff. Uh, I've tried it myself a few times, not a ton to really say I love it, like it or whatever. But th those gels are, are they're, they're different. They taste great. They always have sat well with me. So um, I would say, is it worth the extra money? Uh, I would, tr I would try the gels. I mean, depending on what your, uh, what your issues or if you have any issues with current sport drink, I think that the sport drinks out there are similar and even the Martin drink is, is kind of similar, but those gels, they're a little different. So I would, I'd probably put my money in the gels and see if you like them. Uh, then you said, you ask, I hate the taste of sport drink after a certain amount of time period. I want just water. Is my body telling me something? Yes. Your body is telling you something. Your body is saying, uh, change it up. <laughs> I've, I've had my athletes call it athlete mouse or not mouse mouth, athlete mouth. And it's that sugary, like, Oh my gosh, I just don't want more, uh, more sugar going through my system. And that's why going back to the hydration bladder and, and bottle, uh, mixture is I drink probably a one for one sport drink in water. And I also eat salt. In other discussions, I've said the athlete has an emotional palate and you want to change it up before you get emotional. You want to change the sweet to a salt before it starts telling you something because that's going to also drive your um, desire to drink more. It's also going to drive your desire to eat more. And, it's, and if, if you stay ahead of the game with kind of changing between sweet and savory, uh, as well as washing pure water over your mouth and, and kind of clearing out those taste buds, uh, you'll, you'll find more success in your nutrition, hydration, plan, and game execution. Cool. Great. Uh, okay. So I think that covered most of the questions. I know I'm about 15 minutes over. So let me um, talk about race day strategies very quickly, and then we'll summarize. Um, the first one, <laughs> you'll go to the go to the pre-race meeting because Ken Clover, the founder of the race, he's he's a uh, he's a personality in himself. He's a great guy as well, and he'll he'll tell you to be tough. You got to be tough, okay? Um, dig deep and all that kind of stuff. And it's a bunch of hoorah, like it's crazy in there in the pre-race meeting. But like he's he is so right. You have to be tough for this event, and you have to be prepared to be tough when you don't want to be tough because crap's going to happen. You're going to get flats. You're going to get emotional palate. <laughs> You're going to get emotional as a human being. 
you're going to get to the top of Columbine and be like, oh my God, I can't breathe. What is going on? And eat, drink, and move forward. That's your mantra. Okay. You, you want to take action before that emotion wraps you up. Okay. And that action is to pedal and it's to eat and drink. And when you're having all the negative self-talk and all the negotiations in your head of like, man, I just want to walk right now. Oh man, I want to stop and go underneath that tree. You just have to say, no, nope, keep moving forward. And you have to remember why you're there. Because once you start negotiating with yourself of like, I could just, I could just pull over right now. I could just stop at this aid station. Sure you can, but you can also keep moving forward because you put yourself in this situation, right? There was a reason why you signed up for the Leadville 100. And I want you to remember why you sign up for the Lego 100. Because when you finish that event, it's very arbitrary. You get a medal, there's some cheering and stuff, right? But man, the stuff that you overcome throughout the process, that's big stuff, okay? So remember why you're there. If you, if you don't know why you sign up for it, well, ask yourself that. Maybe write it down. Try to figure it out before race day because come race day, you'll, you'll have to figure it out, okay? Now, some of the other applicability aspects of this, this is going to be really cold generally on race morning. So you want to have a warm jacket or even pants to start this thing because when you get there to your corral, somebody had a question on corrals. I probably won't answer it specifically, but I'll try. Um, you'll get prescribed a corral. You go up to your corral and you get to stand there, lay your bike down. Um, you can't really walk away because you check in. And once you've more or less checked in, you're more or less there. Okay. Now go to the pre-race meeting because they'll tell you all the details that you need. The summary is <clears throat> there's corrals from fast people to the last people. Okay. Uh, and they're preset and it's, you're going to be cold and standing around for a very long time period. If you're not one of those lucky people that, um, have a house downtown Leadville, it is cold. So have warm stuff. I've had athletes tell me they go to Goodwill and just get like giant sweatshirts uh, that they just peel off and like throw in a garbage can. <laughs> so it's, I mean, you can do that or you can have somebody there that takes your, uh, your warm clothes from you on the start line. Uh, I've already gone over e-drink um, early and often. Uh, we talked about stopping at the aid stations, but do that because I think most of us on here are not going for the win. Uh, and even I've had athletes who won this thing. And, uh, I remember one year she stopped at a, at an aid station cause she had dropped bottles and stuff and she needed to pick that up. So it, you're not over stopping at an aid station. Okay. Now have a pacing plan. Okay. Go back, look at the historical data of what your, whatever your goal time is. If, if you can even like tell yourself you have a goal time, um, start looking at where the check-in points are along the way and, and, and what time you're going to be coming through there. Now, if, if you don't, and I would say encourage, I would encourage you, even if it's 12 hours, do it, map it out so that you, you have an understanding of when you're going to be coming through these things. And then if you, if you're going a little bit better than you thought, meaning you're going through a little bit faster on the aid stations, check in with yourself. Are you in control? Are you spreading yourself too thin or are you just feeling good? And maybe you under, um, estimated what you could do. Okay. That's fine. But are you spread too thin? And are you going, are you getting through the aid station slower? Okay. Um, now on the fly, you can adjust your pacing accordingly. Okay. Um, and be realistic about it. Finally, altitude considerations. We're probably not going to have a ton of time that I didn't think that we would to get into a lot of this, but keep in mind, you're in the high country. Okay. You're in Leadville, very rustic <laughs> area as you're, you, some of you may already know, um, and some of you are going to find out, but the altitude considerations are real. And I, I presented this chart here. This is coming from uh, uh, Bassett. And what this is telling you here, just real quick, what this is telling you is uh, Leadville starts at 10,000 feet. You kind of dip down to about 9,000, then you go up to 12. So we're really talking about this area right here. And what the research is telling us is that off of if you're a non acclimated athlete okay meaning you don't live at altitude go back to that 20 minute power okay 
you are going to have a, my mouse is acting up here, but you're going to have anywhere between a 20 to 25% decrement in performance for basically functional threshold power. Uh, and it goes exponentially as you go harder. So VO2 power, sprint power, all this kind of stuff. Um, so you, long story short, at 10,000 feet, you got to knock 20 watt or 20% off of that functional threshold power of what you can sustain realistically. Okay. Um, and you have to understand that you will not, if you're training with power, you will not have that same ability for as long up high. Everybody can do 200 watts. How long can you hold it? Well, all of us is less up there. Meanwhile, the other implications for those of you who don't have power, your breathing is going to be completely elevated. There are mechanisms in your brain that regulate your response to altitude. Everybody's a little different, but at this extreme altitude, a lot of people are the same, meaning it is a stress. Your body senses that it's in a hypoxic environment and it needs to go slower because there's not enough O2, not enough oxygen uh, to deliver to the working muscles, therefore slow down. And that's what's happening. So I encourage you on race day, uh, if your goals are to finish, if your goals are 10 to 12 hours, uh, start moderate and be moderate all day, medium, medium hard all day. Okay. If you've got goals of sub nine, you got to practice and train. I would encourage you to get up to altitude if you can. Uh, and do some race pace efforts up there because it's, it's very different. If you have not experienced altitude, it's very different. Finally, I'll say, <clears throat> ideally, it's best to get there seven to 10, to 10 days prior. Okay. Um, many people may be even laughing or commenting right now, oh, seven to 10 days, I can't do that. Well, a lot of us can. If you can, though, if you can work remotely or whatever, go for it. Because if you can get up there and have some exposure time to altitude and ride, you're going to be tired, sure, um, and you're, you're going to experience uh, altitude for what it is. That the skin will dry out. You're going to drink a lot more and burn a lot more calories, even at rest. But you'll start to regulate, and that is seven to ten days is ideal if if you're not uh, acclimated up there. Now, if you don't have that the luxury of time, I would encourage you. Man, day three is usually day three and four is usually your worst. So I would not encourage you. So I'd probably come up. Thursday, come up on Thursday, you know, easy ride on Friday, pre-race meeting, race on Saturday, and then get back to sea level. Um, <clears throat> however, there are, everybody's a little different. So if you've had altitude exposures before or whatever, you can have a couple days, get your sleep cycle under control. Uh, generally that's okay if you've had those exposure times, but just know that based on the research, you you will have to moderate your pace because there's no way that you'll be able to maintain the same uh, output at altitude that you normally do at sea level. Okay. Now, in summary, just to wrap this up, uh, a proper taper does include you know around 14 days. Uh, we use an exponential fast decay. If you can get 21 days, that's more ideal based on the athlete training, whatever you have time available. You want to decrease the volume by 41 to 60 percent. You want to maintain similar intensity, maintain similar frequency, maybe drop that off by a day. Uh, your peak after this taper can be upwards of 6%. So if you're going to go up to altitude and you're already going to take a hit on the power output, anyway, might as well uh, taper properly and, and augment that a little bit. Finally, altitude, uh, it's a major factor and you're going to be in extreme altitude. So you want conservative pacing and exposure, if possible, to, to training. Come race day, your number one success will be the execution of a well-planned out hydration and nutrition plan. So spend time figuring that out right now. Apply it to your training. And come race day, you will be much more successful because of it. So I went long. Sorry, Corey. Um, we probably even had some people drop off, but that's fine. Um, I'll just say, you know, let's take a, a couple more questions and then, uh, we'll wrap this up as best we can. Um, can you address my question related to training at altitude? Um, if you could maybe type in, I, I, sorry, there, there's a lot of questions here. Do you want to retype your, uh, question related to altitude? That'd be, that'd be great. Francisco. Um, 
about citrulline malate supplement to increase aerobic condition prior to altitude. Uh, so utilizing citrulline malate, it's not as effective as, well, I haven't found it to be uh, very effective. Um, I know that there are some products out there in it uh, or with citrulline malate in it. And I'm not, I don't know the exact mechanism that it uses uh, for uh, oxygen delivery to the working muscle, but you're better served. I wouldn't really fuss around with it. I would get some type of altitude exposure because everything, again, is regulated in the brain, no matter what you take. Finally, I'll say dietary nitrate, if you're going to supplement with something, is better because that, that actually does help um, uh, put nitric oxide into the system to help uh, get fuel to the working muscle. So I would, I would use dietary nitrate if I'm going to supplement with anything. Um, if you don't have time to acclimate, oh, this, oh no, this is Catherine. Uh, Catherine, if you don't have time to acclimate to altitude, should you go as close to the race as possible, i.e. day before, or get there? Yeah, so kind of like I said, Catherine, um, if you can't get there seven to ten days out, um, the research says get there the night before, excuse me, get there the night before and then race the next day. However, I'll say this, with a lot of my athletes when I've tried that, generally does not work well because Leadville, in particular, it's hard to get to. So even say you get into Denver, then you got to drive to Leadville, then you got to pick up your, your, uh, packet, then you go to pre-race meeting, you got to put your bike together, maybe go. So I would get there Thursday with enough time, put your bike together. You got Friday morning to ride a little bit. Hopefully you get some sleep on Thursday. You probably won't though, because the first night up at altitude, you don't. So then Friday, you get your habits better under control. Hopefully get some sleep that day. And then you race on Friday. That goes a little bit against the research, but again, the application of it seems to be better for athletes that I've coached. Uh, sorry, Eric, is audio better? Okay, Francisco, I've been climbing to 8,200 feet on my mountain bike, uh, training at 80 to 85% FTP. Would that help somehow as training at altitude. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 8,200 feet is, is very good altitude to get to. If you can ride up there more like longer, that's great. Uh, but yeah, riding up to that altitude, that's great. That's exposure time. And yeah, if you, I mean, if you can pump out, you know, 80, 85% FTP maintained up there, that's good. Um, depending on whatever else you're doing in your training, um, probably don't need to go any harder, but yeah, that's great. Yeah, a uh, couple audio outs, so I'm, I am sorry about that. But I'm just scanning through, uh, scanning through the rest of the questions. I think I've addressed all of them. If anybody, if I missed any questions, I do apologize. But uh, if there's a you know a burning desire of something that I missed, or if you got another question, fire away on it right now. Um, otherwise, we can wrap this up. Francisco, you're welcome. Eric, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. And, and you're, you're welcome. Could be my uh, my connection uh, as well. But yeah, okay. That seems like it is it for the questions. I hope I hope everybody has taken away at least one thing that will help them prepare for Leadville this year. And if you're not doing Leadville and you just came in for some general um, information on tapering, peaking, and, and maybe hydration, nutrition, and you got some other goofy, uh, <laughs> goofy extreme goal out there, but hopefully you can take away from, from this as well. So, uh, thank you everybody for your time. This will, this has been recorded and we will, uh, make it available to you all, uh, in the future. So thanks again, and we'll see you out there maybe in Liverpool.